Hello, my name is Janine Eldridge, and I am your instructor for the class ENG 290, The Movies. This week, we're going to be talking about understanding photography and mise-en-scene. Our course objective this week is analyzing how a film communicates through various techniques such as camera angles and framing, special effects, writing, acting, and sequencing. Uh, students will understand the six categories of film shots and analyze and identify aspect ratios. So, this week, you'll be learning all of that through course supplementals, your textbook, uh, a couple of lectures that I have here for you, and your own independent research. What I want to do is touch on, for this moment, uh, the concept of shots as it pertains to photography. Now, when you are talking about filmmaking, we'll talk about the beginning of a film starts something called principal photography because the cinematographer is also known as the DP. The DP is the director of photography because a lot of the concepts that we use in terms of filming a movie comes from photography, which is the earlier incarnation of filmmaking. If we didn't have photography first, we would never have filmmaking. And a lot of the early photographers, or the early cinematographers, I should say, uh, borrowed heavily from those techniques. Now, the techniques that the early photographers gave us. Now, you're going to learn about a number of topics, but I'm going to jump down to camera angles, camera shots, and camera movements. And one of the reasons I'm jumping down to that is because I uh, find that that is one of the things that seems to cause problems for some students in terms of how they understand how a film is put together. Now let's talk about something first called shot sizes. Shot sizes uh, will start master shot or establishing shot. This is also called a wide shot. And the reason you have a wide shot or a master shot, it establishes where you are. It gives a quick understanding to the audience of the time period sometimes. Uh, you can also find out whether this is a town or a city that the story is happening in. You can also find out whether or not <coughs> uh, the characters are uh, on a planet or in a town or whatever. So it gives geography, it gives time in some instances, and it also gives uh, the setting. So. You have all of that information, sometimes in that first establishing shot. If you think about it, for those of you who are fans of sitcoms, you'll notice that the first shot in every sitcom, just about, is the establishing shot. And sometimes it's just a still. I'll give you two quick examples. Those of you who are fans of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The first thing you see is a picture of that house, the house that uh, Fresh Prince lives in. So you have that quick establishing shot of the house, and then you see the action that's going to take place within that house. Uh, so that's your master shot. Then you also have your full shot, your medium shot, your medium close-up, close-up, and extreme close-up. Each one of these shots gives you a little bit more information. <clears throat> and when the farther you go away from the wide shot, the more detail you're trying to include. For instance, if we have the little man on the bridge in this uh, shot for the wide shot, as opposed to the map full shot, we can't see his expression. But the closer we get to him from the wide shot to the medium close-up, to the close-up, to the extreme close-up, we can see his facial expressions. We can tell whether or not he's happy, sad, that kind of thing. And one of the reasons you want to do that 
is not just because of the person's face. You want to give more detail about something in the scene. Perhaps if you're watching a horror movie, perhaps you're able to find out who the villain is because you see a close-up of the knife in his pocket or something like that, or the gun in his pocket, whatever it is, it's a horror movie. Uh, details give uh, the different shot sizes allows us to tell a fuller version of the story. So I'm going to move down to this little graphic here, uh, shot sizes, camera and movements, and shot angles. So when we talk about the shot sizes, we also do a little bit of a shorthand. Um, instead of saying extreme long shot or extreme wide shot, you'll see it sometimes written as WS or XLS, especially uh, our friends in the United Kingdom, they like to use XLS or LS for long shot. And some people here do it as well. And it's essentially the same thing. If you notice between this master shot, and I'm going to scroll back down to this XLS, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, then you move on to MCU, which is a medium close-up, close-up. All of these are varying degrees of close-up. It's just as close as you can get it will give you more detail. Uh, I'm going to move here to shot angles. Now shot angles are where the camera is in space in relation to the subject. So in order for me to get a low angle shot, like the little low angle shot of the character's face here, what I need to do is I need to take the camera and I need to put it beneath my subject so that the camera is looking up. The camera in this instance becomes the audience's viewpoint. It becomes the audience's, audience's eyes. So, low angle. That gives us a little bit of a psychological impact. It is allowing us to view the character as if he is grandiose, larger than life. It also does something else as well. It gives us a little bit of inkling into the character state of mind. Think about superhero films. Superheroes have a tendency to be shown in low angles. That makes them look more impressive. Think about how many times, if you're a fan of uh, the Marvel comic uh, movies, think about how many times you see Spider-Man perched on top of a building, Superman perched on top of a building. Yes, I know Superman is DC Comics. But it still follows the same kind of rules. So low angle gives us a little bit of an inkling into the character. He's larger than life. He has authority. Um, an eye level makes us at the same level as the character in the piece. Uh, it's not really a judgment. Then you have something next to it called a high angle. So when you have a high angle, this is the camera above the subject and the sub and you're looking down on the subject. Now, in a shorthand, you're looking down on the subject because it's going to give the subject a little bit more, um, seem, seem a little bit more vulnerable. It's going to make the subject, uh, seem as if he may be lost. It also can do something else in terms of the subject. It can also give more information. Uh, remember we were talking about the details a few minutes ago? Same thing here. You might have a better vantage point as the audience member through a high angle uh, shot than any of the other shots. Let's say maybe there is a threat coming from overhead. If it's in a high angle shot, you can show that threat coming towards the uh, victim <coughs> who might be the subject in the frame. Then you have other shots too, which are variations on the low angle, high angle, and the eye level shots. You have an extreme low angle. Sometimes it's called a worm's eye view. And again, it's given detail and it's also making a judgment on that particular character. Now, 
This is the basis of these different shot angles, but more can be done with these shot angles given the material that you're watching. Uh, more can be given based on the, the, the story, the characters, the particular scene within. But I want you to think about these different shot angles as you're watching and see what kind of gut reaction you're having to the information that you're seeing on the screen because it's going to allow you to analyze the film because of that. Next to it, you have, uh, um, in addition to the uh, low angle, this is a higher angle. And then you also have something that is called a bird's eye view, or sometimes it is also called a God's eye view, but mostly is the bird's eye view because it's a very high angle and it's doing the same thing that we talked about before. It's making the character seem vulnerable. You get to see a little bit more about uh, his life and you can combine the shot angles with the shot sizes and you can combine them with the movement. So you can have a lot of things happening in one shot. Uh, so, for example, let's say we have a high angle shot. We also have, uh, yeah, let's say we're doing a high angle shot. And then it also ends up being a uh, wide shot for us. And then also we're moving at the same time. So what ends up happening with all of this information going back and forth in the same scene, in the same shot without being cut and the cut is uh, basically where you actually change from one shot size or shot angle or camera movement to another within the same cut you're giving an audience a lot of information for example the beginning of Forrest Gump you're following a feather in the beginning of Forrest Gump that feather you're following it down from the clouds uh, the camera is panning over the town. You're, and then you end up zooming in on the character of Forrest Gump. That was a lot of information within that one piece. So you got a chance to look over the entire town. You got a chance to have a sense of movement. Uh, it gave you a little bit more information, a sense of whimsy, a little, it was a, like you're going to be taken on this journey and you're going to be told a very sweet yet simple story. Camera and lens movements. So when you're, um, when we talk about camera and lens movements, we're talking about the camera actually moving. Uh, there are some times where there are things where the camera is not moving, but yet it is focusing in on a particular object and it does that through zooming. So when the camera actually moves, like panning left or panning right, it's sitting on a tripod and literally the head, the camera itself is like turning its head. Well, the camera doesn't have a head, but like your own head, you're turning to the left or right to look at something. This is the camera is swiveling left to right or right to left. So that is the panning and that is giving you a panoramic view and it's giving you an uninterrupted view of what you're looking at. Now, you also have something called crab left or crab right. Again, sometimes it's not even uh, called crab left or crab right. Sometimes it's called dollying left or dollying right. The UK, uh, as well as New Zealand and Australia, Sometimes they'll talk about something crabbing left or crabbing right. So what you can do when you're talking about <coughs> crabbing left or crabbing right is you're taking the camera and your camera is, well, well is actually moving. Sometimes it's on a, a tripod that has wheels and it's literally moving left to right within the same shot. Or it's a, uh, or you can also dolly, which D O L L Y, which is on a track 
like almost like a train track and it has the camera.